we want to shift gears now uh, and talk about uh, what's been called the Make the World Better panel, but the focus will be on regenerative business. And I'd like to take uh, this moment to invite our panelists on stage. Uh, we have uh, joining us remotely as well uh, will be uh, Sage Lissert, so if we can uh, have her join in. I'll invite uh, Mike Williamson, uh, CEO uh, and founding partner of Cascadia Seaweed to the stage. Uh, Bram Vandenberg, uh, COO and CFO uh, of Circular Rubber Technologies, and uh, Tracy Lydia from uh, Foresight. Please join us on stage, and uh, we'll get you some microphones here. Uh, for everybody here, uh, if we could just lead with some introductions, uh, just a bit about who you are, your organization, uh, and what you're working on right now that might be of interest to the room. So um, why don't we start with you, Sage, uh, if you don't mind going first. Hadid, Sage, Lesert, Sadni, Tebes, Natalia, Le Kwangin, Keo, Saikana, Lashabu, Injen, Yinkaktene, Keo, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sage Lassert. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I just acknowledge the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, um, now known as Victoria on Vancouver Island, uh, where I was born and I live and work and play. And uh, I'm carrier from the Lake Babine Nation, which is in North Central BC. I think I was invited here today to talk about. Uh, my company, which is called Sage Initiative. We're the first and only Indigenous women's impact investment collective nationally in Canada. Um, and so we teach Indigenous women skills and capacities to make small and medium-sized investments in Indigenous-owned social purpose businesses. Um, and kind of just bringing in that heart-centered piece and remembering that all of this work is for our loved ones and our kin and for Mother Earth and just acknowledging my position as well at the Moose Hide campaign. I think that financial independence and a community's prosperity is tightly linked to harm reduction and ensuring the folks in our communities are safe and so creating solutions to create that safety and prosperity is really the essence of my personal and professional theory of change. So thank you very much for having me today, Masi Cho. Thank you, Sage. Uh, Tracy, if you can go next, please. Okay, is this working? Hi, I'm Tracy Lydiot. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the lands of Okanagan Salix people, and I'm grateful to be here. I am the Mining Innovation Project Manager with Foresight Canada. Foresight Canada is a national nonprofit, and we are focused on the ecosystem building and adoption of clean tech technologies in Canada. And we are a capacity building organization. Thank you. Uh, Mike. Good afternoon. My name is Mike Williamson, and I'm the CEO, president, and co founder of Cascadia Seaweed. We're an ag tech company. We install low impact farms in the ocean off the coast of British Columbia. We sustainably grow seaweed and we turn it into regenerative agriculture products for soil and bovine health. All of our farms are in partnership with British Columbia First Nations communities. We are a 20 person company. We've been in business for four years and we are expanding our production and capability year on year. Uh, and Bram from Circular Rubber Technologies. Uh, Bram from the work, Circular Rubber Technologies. We were founded in late 2019, female founded and led. Uh, we are a waste to value company striving for the infinite reuse of the world's rubber. Uh, we're focused on end of life mining truck tires and we've developed a proprietary process to recover the rubber and create a tire-to-tire -tire service um, whereby you can reuse the, uh, the rubber in the manufacturing process of brand new tires. Just as an anecdote, like uh, the World Economic Forum in Davao uh, distributed a report this year and that the world's circularity use is actually going down. So, it used to be 11% circle material use. Now we're down to 7%, and we strive to make a difference, at least in the world of rubber. 
uh, rubber is, well, represents 1.3 million ton of end-of-life mining truck tires, and we, we strive to make a, the world a better place. That's what we do. We're building our first plant in uh, Red Deer, Alberta, and we hope to be up and running uh, early next year. Wonderful. Thanks, Bram, and thanks to all the panelists. Um, most of the panelists here are uh, you know, from very different backgrounds. One of the things that brings them together is uh, they've all been featured in Make the World Bet Better magazine, and uh, hopefully one day, Sage, we can get the Sage Initiative in there, too. Um, sustainable uh, as well, just uh, ahead of that, has also been inside of the Make the World Better magazine. Uh, and one of the things that we wanted to um, focus on, really, as a thematic uh, tie-in is regenerative business. So uh, maybe we can start with you, Sage. Uh, can you talk to us about investing in regenerative businesses? Uh, and in particular, what does a regenerative business look like to you? It was something that was introduced to me actually when I started my business I was just finishing um, I was at, I was a student at the University of Victoria and I was studying um, equity diversity and inclusion policies and so finding myself kind of more human centered and I had a couple shillings, I had a couple coins, and I wanted to make sure that they went uh, somewhere that would benefit Indigenous communities and make sure that there was a climate and gender lens associated with where that money went. Um, and so I learned a little bit more from uh, Raven Capital Indigenous Partners, which if you're familiar with impact investment landscape in Canada, you'll know that they're at the forefront of um, impact investing in Indigenous communities, but also um, through their impact measurement framework, uh, which is called the RIM. And so I went to Raven Capital and I said, hey, I have a couple bucks. I don't know, um, I, I don't know too much about impact investing yet but I know that I haven't found any investment products that are in alignment with my values and that are uh, sustainable and specific to indigenous communities that not only have the climate lens, but also the gender lens and the social lens. And so they introduced me to the um, indigenous community driven outcomes contracts, uh, which in my case was, um, a green energy or sustainable energy company that was indigenous owned in Winnipeg called Aki Energy. And they install geothermal heating units underneath the homes. So they would dig up like basically your whole front yard, install these geothermal heating units and members of the community would install them, maintain them. You would save about $900 um, on your energy bill by the end of that year and the way that the outcomes contract works is that the government would come in and they would pay for those outcomes so recognizing that communities would have jobs and that they would be saving $900 they would pay for those outcomes and that was my first investment in the space and so you can imagine that I got really excited and I built a circle for all of my friends to join along but that was my first taste of understanding what it's like to create a solution that's very effective, that has climate metrics, and that also can improve the health of a community, making sure that folks um, are, are warm uh, in the winter, especially in sites like reservations in, in Winnipeg. So um, that's an example that I wanted to share. And one of the reasons that is my why about why I got started and why it feels so important to have conversations like these to continue creating new pathways that support the communities that are equity deserving in, in this country. And for me, I'm talking about Canada specifically, um, but I appreciate building these frameworks and models and being able them to, to apply them anywhere. You can use that model in any country and um, being able to share these resources is very helpful. So I appreciate getting the chance to share that example. Thank you. Um, and I think, Tracy, uh, I wanted to also turn to you. And you've got a really interesting background when we were talking ahead of the conference. Um, but you know, from a mining innovation standpoint, um, you know, how does regenerative business tie into what you do or what you look for uh, in terms of trying to accelerate new businesses? 
It's such a great question, thank you. Um, thank you, Sage, as well. I think you've highlighted a really important point about the benefit of regenerative businesses from an inclusive inclusivity and the social side of sustainability. I have like the 10,000 foot penthouse view, that's how my brain works, and my master's is in strategic leadership and sustainability. So I think about these things from a really high level systems perspective, and to me, regenerative business means exactly what we were talking about this morning with the first keynote, is that those the bottom part of that triangle has been incorporated into the company's um, the way that they value things, the natural capital, so the ecological systems that we draw from and the social side that we need to rely on, say to run our business or community partnerships has been incorporated into how we do business. That's currently what I think is missing. And my other um, fun story about this is one of my mentors is Dr. Bob Willard. I'm not sure if any of you are aware of him. If you're not, you should really look this man up. Um, he's an incredible finance background and talks about the business case for sustainability and one of the favorite things that he says is if you were at a marriage counselor and somebody and your marriage counselor said, hey, can you describe your relationship to me? And you said, oh, it's sustainable. Not really the best answer that you want to give. You'd probably get a good thump from your partner. And so I really like that because sustainability is the absolute bare minimum that we should be aiming for, and specifically this morning that came up in the code, regenerative business is where is our end shot. That is where we should be looking. And from a mining perspective, I think the very first thing is circular economy strategies. So mining itself is not regenerative in the current methods and the ways that we define the mining industry, but we need to think about circular strategies that we can implement on projects as well as across the whole life cycle and how we're thinking about mining. I truly believe mining can be regenerative if we start to shift our model and think about where we're getting our mined materials from. Thank you, yeah, and I think you know the, the challenges of building that business are, are this great segue into um, the next set of questions, which, uh, you know, for both Mike and Bram, um, it's sort of like a, a live reality every day as part of what they're doing. So maybe Mike, if I could ask you to talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, the, the first person view, what are the challenges and opportunities uh, that you see in building a regenerative business? The problem with going uh, third in a panel on answering a question is your fellow panelists will uh, say the same points you were going to say. When we started, um, we talked about sustainability and realized, as you said, that that's status quo and that's not good enough. So we have to get into regenerative. And a regenerative business sometimes looks at existing problems and comes up with better solutions. That leads to an education process, and you have to talk to the investment community, and you have to talk to the user community to say that your new way of doing business is better than the status quo, and it might involve thinking that is not in uh, common parlance. So in our case, we grow seaweed in the ocean, which is even in and of itself sometimes a difficult thing for folks to understand, and then we turn it into products for food security in the agriculture sector. So when we started our regenerative business in British Columbia, the Ministry of Agriculture said, no, you better go talk to the aquaculture folks. We went to the aquaculture folks, and of course, no, you better go talk to the agriculture folks. So we've always worked that gap between two different major sectors and two different industries. So a regenerative business can have the best ideas, but it has to be translatable into concepts that investors, regulatory bodies, and users and consumers, in our case B2B, understand. The fundamental principle of what you do has to be great. It has to be better than the status quo. But even though once that part is done, you have to speak in terms that folks understand, you have to relate your regenerative solution back to an existing solution, and then let people see the value add of what you're doing and why your new regenerative solution is better than what currently exists. Thanks, Mike. Um, Bram, uh, can, can you maybe tack on to that? Well, great segue, Mike. I think in our business is somewhat different in the sense that the, the 
common practice in the mining industry is just landfilling. So I guess we have at least an advantage in the terms of the technology we present is kind of new, uh, although devulcanization is from the 50s. But what, what we did early on is uh, we did a true price analysis on the price of natural rubber. Uh, if you look at all the social economic uh, aspects as well as the environmental aspects, like virgin rubber should be trading at $18,000 per ton today if you bring everything into play. So I think the biggest difference for us is we can create a product that's uh, equally good as virgin natural rubber at a cost reduction compared to growing virgin natural rubber today. So that was the, the biggest opportunity. Um, where does the challenge come in? I think it's primarily on the, on the offtake side. It's, uh, and then related to that is the investor side. A lot of the investors say, well, show me an offtake contract from a, from a tire manufacturer and then we'll invest you the money whereas the tire manufacturer says, build me a plant and I'll come and audit the plant and then I'll, I'll get you your off-day contract. So that's, that's the, the Mexican standoff that we're uh, in the middle of. And it's going well. And it, I would say we've qualified our material. We've gone through all the steps leading up to a facility audit. Um, the other thing I will say, like if you compare rubber reclaim, for example, with carbon black. A tire manufacturer might say, hey, carbon black is great because it's a drop-in replacement for virgin carbon black, if there is such a thing. Whereas uh, using reclaim requires some adopt, uh, adoption on, of the formulation of the compound. So those are some of the challenges that we faced. And we have overcome those. Thanks, Bram. Yeah, and, and if anybody wants to learn more about the intricacies of devulcanization, um, it's, I swear it's an interesting <laughs> topic to explore. Um, I encourage you to talk to Bram uh, afterwards about it. Uh, I want to shift gears slightly to talk about um, partnerships, especially with indigenous peoples in Canada, and using that as um, a component of building a business. Uh, Mike, Maybe you could talk to us a little bit about, you know, like one uh, important theme that you could pull out in your experience uh, about creating successful partnerships uh, and working with indigenous um, in indigenous partners. So Cascadia Seaweed works on the coast of British Columbia and between the southern tip of Vancouver Island and the northern tip of uh, Prince Rupert and the Alaskan border. There's, I think it's a hundred different bands and nations and one of the questions I get asked often is what is it like dealing with the First Nations and I say what's it like dealing with your neighbor and they say which neighbor I say which First Nation each one of the nations we deal with is a sovereign community different values different ways of doing business and different interests so the first thing we do when we deal with an indigenous community is to remember that God gave us two ears and one mouth so we should listen twice as much as we talk. And once we get past that stage and folks are willing to have a conversation, we have a conversation. I never go into a, a community or a nation with a solution. My solution is not gonna match their needs. And we have to make sure that there's an alignment of values. Then once the relationship is established and it can take days, weeks, months, years, centuries, we try to understand what the business interests of the nation is, what the values are, and in our case, because we work in the ocean, we work in their backyards, and they've been stewards of the environment for millennia, we make sure that there's a business alignment and there's a values alignment, and then we can talk about what we can do with the nations. And the type of partnerships we do are to license water lots or tenures in the ocean. We help get funding to put farms in, and then we create economic opportunity with that, which each, with each of our partner nations. Of course, there's no one size fits all. It's all about dialogue, creating a forum for mutual respect, and then moving onward from there. So currently we're with signed contracts with eight different nations, again, from the southernmost tip of BC to the northernmost coastal tip of BC. 
and we have a number of other nations that want to join us in our journey for regenerative agriculture. Thanks, Mike. Um, Sage, I, I, I'm mindful of where we are sort of on the schedule, but I wonder from your perspective if you could offer uh, maybe one important theme as well. Uh, what makes a successful partnership? Mike, I really appreciate what you shared. Obviously, living in Victoria, I'm very familiar with Cascadia and um, have met Robert multiple times. And so just want to um, acknowledge uh, as someone who is a part of our local community, Songhees and Esquimalt Nations, um, that that's how your company culture feels, that people um, feel that way about how uh, your relationships are built. The only piece that I'll share is um, just surrounding um, money trauma. I think that Indigenous people have had a really rift relationship with the state um, and, and with um, Western concepts of commerce. And um, there are very real policies uh, embedded within the Indian Act that are actively working against Indigenous people today um, to disenfranchise us from the systems that are currently in place. And so just being tender um, and gentle uh, when entering relationships that might spark some money trauma. Um, and I would suggest using circle-based conversations, making sure that people feel safe by having um, some of their people in the room with them, making sure you're trauma-informed so they know what's going to happen. Um, there's an agenda that you follow, you offer content warnings, um, and circle-based meaning that everyone gets to speak and um, everyone's voice is respected and boundaries are respected and consent is practiced is very important. It doesn't happen enough in the corporate sector. And so it's a gentle reminder for folks to make sure that you're being aware of the historical and contemporary context in which indigenous entrepreneurs face every single day um, that settlers don't. So um, wanting to just call some gentle attention to that tender loving care. <laughs> Thank you, Sage, uh, and thank you, Mike, for that. Uh, I know that we're getting close to time here, so I'll try and uh, move things along. But in terms of uh, your own business and trying to grow it, uh, if you can offer uh, maybe a quick take on what investors are asking you uh, to demonstrate with such innovative technologies. And the preface to that is if you're doing something new or you're doing something differently than what might be considered um, sort of a conventional approach, how do you uh, get investors on side, or how do you communicate uh, sort of what you do, or if that might be too complex, just what are some of the questions that you're hearing investors ask of you? Uh, we'll start with you, Bram. I think, especially early on when we went on the investment journey, I think it's all about the team. The, the first question that comes out, do we believe in the team uh, that's gonna pull this off, and then, Closely related to that, what is the market size? What are you going after? To, I think it was said earlier on in an earlier session, if the total market potential is five million, then it's probably not worth the effort to go after. So I think you need to show a decent sized market, a good team, and then a competitive advantage. I think those are the three key items that what we've learned from uh, our discussions with uh, investors. Okay, great, and Mike? In our homework before the panel, the question was, is it possible to make money and do good? The answer that, is that, a that's, that's the thunder question at the end. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I thought we were there. That's okay. Go for well, it. So the answer is absolutely yes. And it, you still have to do the same basic principles that Bram talked about. The company has to be profitable. The company has to be run according to standardly accepted metrics. It has to produce product at less cost than it sells for, and particularly in this form, it has to be done in a socially responsible, environmentally responsible, and governancely, I know that's not a word, governancely responsible <laughs> manner as well. So you have to meet all the same precepts of standard business, the team, the product, the market, and you have to actually 
believe in the social and environmental benefit that you bring as well. And it's a resounding yes, you can make money while making a difference. All right, so since we're Sorry a big, no, you know what, we're a big fan of hybrids in this room. So uh, Tracy, why don't um, you take on both of those questions? Okay. Oh my gosh. I love this panel. This is fun. Um, well, for some, from Foresight's perspective, as I shared, we're a capacity building organization. And so we work with innovators. We have accelerator programs. But also from the investor side, we put those innovators through a four-week investment readiness program. And the kinds of things that we're seeing from investors is they want to have, again, a good leadership team, great point, that you believe in your product, and that also that you have traction. So we're hoping that that's one of the ways that we can help in innovators um, bridge that gap, because that's quite challenging at times, especially if companies don't want to share data or other things that you've identified. And am I answering the thunder question? You are. OK. <laughs> uh, can you do good and still make money? Hell yes. Uh, just look at Patagonia. Um, some other examples I'd like to share is a company called Boreo. They harvest ghost fishing nets out of the ocean in conjunction with the government of Chile and now spin and sell the polyester to Patagonia, REI, other large manufacturers. And then another one I love talking about is Interface Floor Carpet Company in the US. Uh, great example of a complete decoupling from business as usual. Strong leadership saying, we are planting our flag, we are climbing Mount Sustainability, and if you want to look at um, the ways that they were able to save money um, just by in adopting similar uh, circular strategies that have been talked about, efficiency, waste to new product, um, they've saved millions and millions of dollars, plus made a lot of money by innovating their product model. So yes, you can. All right, Bram, can you do good and make money? Of course we can, otherwise we wouldn't be in the business. Um, that's the short answer. I know we're over time. Okay, thank you. And Sage, last word to you. Is it possible to do good and make money? Edgar Villanueva, a philanthropist from the US, taught us the phrase money as medicine. Money can be restoried as medicine, as time and energy and the way that we breathe life into things that we love. So yes, money can operate as medicine. Wonderful, and what a great note to end on. Panelists, I know that this is something that we could go on uh, for much longer, and I appreciate you compressing a lot of the, the answers that you would have loved to have given into a short amount of time. Thank you to our audience, uh, and please give a round of applause uh, to our panelists here.